aspect of their life's work in a laboratory or in the field. I found mine in a single projected slide. Early in my graduate student days, I took a class taught by a senior scientist on the greatest hits in the history of life. It was a whirlwind course, a form of speed dating with big puzzles in evolution. Fodder for each week's discussion was a different evolutionary transformation. In one of the initial sessions, the professor displayed a simple cartoon that showed what we knew back then in 1986 about the transition from fish to land-living animals. At the top of the sketch was a fish, and at the bottom was an early fossil amphibian. An arrow pointed from the fish to the amphibian. It was the arrow, not the fish, that caught my eye. I looked at that figure and scratched my head. Fish walking on land? How could that ever happen? This seemed like a first-class scientific puzzle on which to hang my shingle. It was love at first sight. Thus began four decades of expeditions to both poles and several continents in the hunt for fossils to show how this event transpired. Yet, when I tried to explain my quest to relatives and friends, I was often met with pained glances and polite questions. Transforming a fish into a land-living animal meant developing a new kind of skeleton, one with limbs for walking rather than fins for swimming. Moreover, a new way of breathing using lungs rather than gills had to arise. So too, feeding and reproducing had to change. Eating and laying eggs in water is entirely different from what happens on land. Virtually every system in the body would have to transform simultaneously. What good would it be to have limbs for walking on land if the animal couldn't breathe, feed, or reproduce? Living on land requires not just a single invention, but the interplay of hundreds of them. The same difficulty holds for each of the thousands of other transitions in the history of life, from the origins of flight and bipedal walking to the origins of bodies and life itself. My quest seemed doomed from the start. The solution to this dilemma is embedded in a famous quote from the playwright Lillian Hellman. In describing her life, from being blacklisted by the House Un-American Activities Committee during the 1950s to her hard living ways, she once said, nothing, of course, begins at the time you think it did. With that phrase, she unintentionally described one of the most powerful concepts in life's history, one that explains the origin of most every organ, tissue, and bit of DNA in all creatures on planet Earth. The seeds for this idea in biology began as a consequence of the work of one of the most self-destructive figures in all of science, who, true to form, changed the field by being wrong. To grasp the meaning of recent discoveries in the genome, we need to turn to an earlier age of exploration. Victorian England was a crucible for enduring ideas and discoveries. There is something poetic to the notion that knowing how DNA works in the history of life relies on ideas developed during an age when people didn't know that genes even existed. St. George Jackson Mavart, 1827 to 1900, was born to zealously evangelical parents in London. His father had risen from being a butler to owning one of the city's major hotels. Mavart Sr.'s position gave his son the chance to achieve the social standing of a gentleman and accorded him the privilege of entree into the career of his choice. Like his contemporary Charles Darwin, Mivart was born with a passion for nature. As a child, he collected insects, plants, and minerals, often making copious field notes and devising classification schemes. Mivart seemed destined for a career in natural history.